Well, I guess it's time for a shave. What the hell? Hello? What? Come on! Alright, alright, I'll review the goddamn web show. Would you mind rolling the intro as I get ready? Thanks. I kind of figured it was only a matter of time before I got back into this series again. Sure, I would be like the other internet critics out there and review a show's sequel every year on the same month, but given the overwhelming number of seasons, spinoffs, and one-shots that Rooster Teeth has produced for their RVB shows over the years, it would take me roughly 15 years to get all of this done. And let's be honest, I don't plan on doing that for the next decade. With the overwhelming amount of viral success that they had in 2003, Rooster Teeth co-founders Bernie Burns and Matt Hullum decided that they needed to continue their newfound glory on the internet and begin working on a season 2 for Red vs. Blue, which spanned for roughly 19 episodes from January to July in 2004. And if you watchers out there want to check out what had really happened in Season 1, feel free to click this little picture right here, and it'll take you straight to my very first episode of Red vs. Blue Season 1. Wink. Go ahead. I'll wait. A few moments later. Shotgun, I'll show you a real shotgun. Shotgun? There's no vehicles around here. Oh, <laughs> um, let's begin with Season 2. So this season begins with a nice overhead shot of Blood Gulch as we are introduced to the newest person to arrive to the Canyon, Medical Officer Dufresne, or Doc for short. He informs Command that he has finally made it to Blood Gulch and will treat the blue team's injured soldiers. Roger that. Any other orders? Anything else? Yeah, okay, yeah, it says here, whatever you do, don't- Oh. Okay, never mind, dude. I'm not supposed to read you that part. Okay, just, uh, you'll be okay. Just, uh, be very careful. That's all. Great. Whew! Close one, Vic. Whatever that was. So as Doc makes his way to Blue Base, we see our lovely blue comrade in arms doing what they do best, which is standing around and talking. Tucker informs Church that Caboose has been sounding and acting a little different lately. Don't ever be alone. He's doing that thing again. Yeah, it must be the cold just going around. Anyway, Doc informs the Blues that he is here to treat the wounded on their team, which they call out for about three months ago. So Caboose gives Doc a quick recap as to what happened to them in the last season, as he decides to check Caboose and Tucker's vitals and move on to the Red Base. But before he can do that, Church tries to convince Doc to join their side, but he can't do that as he tells the group that not only is he a neutral in this war, but a pacifist as well. And like clockwork, we see the red team mounting a frontal assault on the blues. Oh, that's right. Suck it, blue. Yeah, sneak attack. You magnificent bastard. I read your book. With the reds continuing their attack, Church and Tucker argue over a decent defensive strategy, which just results with the two of them bitching and Church shoots off Caboose's pinky toe because Doc will only get involved if someone is injured. Else wrong. Uh, oh, I got one. Uh, well, sometimes when I fall asleep at night, I think about my parents having sex, and I get really, really mad for some reason. Um, I, uh, don't really know what to say about that one, other than... Meanwhile, the Reds run out of ammunition due to Griff's failure to bring extra rounds, which Sarge decides to try to bluff the Blues into surrendering. 
And so the two teams negotiate terms with the Reds, demanding Lopez's return, but Church cannot do that since he is currently using Mr. Roboto's body. So instead, he delivers Doc to them as a hostage. Even though, Doc was going to be over there anyways. And in return, Griff is forced to publicly humiliate himself to the delight of everyone's pleasure, especially Sarge's. I would just like to let everyone know that I suck, and that I'm a girl, and I want to kiss all the boys. This is embarrassing! As Doc gets all chummy with the Reds, the Blues try to figure out a way to reactivate Lopez's repairing system by turning on a switch which is directly below Church's nether regions. This results in the Jeep being remote controlled and driving itself to Lopez's coordinates while taking Doc for a ride along. And everything that Church is saying is pretty much just automatic orders for the Jeep to follow which brings the Jeep back to Red Base, pinning Sarge up against the wall and nearly killing him in the process. This leads to Ch Tucker just saying fuck it and yanking out all the wires out thus deactivating the Warthog and the Church being unable to move from the waist down. I just felt like I could have taken him. What? You can't fight a machine gun. Yeah, Sarge. I know you're tough and all, but it is kind of hard to beat up hundreds of armor-piercing bullets using only your face. And yet, he surrendered. Because Sarge is a real man, goddammit! Hell yeah! <laughs> as one problem ends, two more begin as Tucker and Caboose try to find a way to reactivate Church's rental legs, and the Reds decide to bring Doc back to the Blues as they realize how much of an accidental screw-up he is. And just like that, neither the Blues nor the Reds want Doc back at their bases, which leaves the poor guy stranded smack dab in the middle of the canyon. As Church and Tucker continue to figure out a solution to their current problem, they are both shocked to hear Caboose's plan has the best solution, which is for Church to leave Lopez's body, let the robot repair itself and their tank, and pop right back into the Hispanic android. This shit, I'm out. And once again, nothing goes according to plan as Lopez heads back to the bread base, only to be diverted back as the Reds decide to mount up a counterattack, believing themselves to think that they are being assaulted. Very poorly. This leaves Lopez to believe that the Reds have returned on him, leaving the poor amigo with no other choice than to work for the Blues and fix their tank. As the Reds lick their wounds once more, they try to fix their Jeep the best they can and come up with theories as to what the hell is going on over at Blue Base. Lopez manages to fix their tank Sheila and it seems like that there may be some love at first sight. Robot? I wasn't aware that our squad was outfitted with a robot. But before a dramatic love triangle can ensue between Caboose, Sheila, and Lopez, Church tries to take back Lopez's body only to find out that this space has already been rented out by someone else. Well, buenos dias, cockbites. Guess who's back? Oh my god, Lopez is a tranny! Or it could just be Tex making her triumphant return as she warns Tucker and Church that the Omega AI has found its way into Caboose's mind, as it hightailed out of text at the last few minutes right before she and the tank blew up in Season 1, so they are back to square one as the Blues devise a new plan to kill the Omega Mally once again without harming Caboose in the process. Meanwhile, over at Red Base, Sarge calls for a meeting as he tells his group that the best course to replacing Lopez is to turn one of his own soldiers into a half-robot in which everyone votes for Simmons to volunteer. Back at Blue Base, Jeez, you know what? I never realized this until now, but this series has a habit of jumping back and forth all of the time. Kind of like watching any episode of Game of Thrones. Oh, where was I? Oh yeah. Since Church and Text are in spiritual form, their plan is to go inside Caboose's mind in order to push out O'Malley while getting Tucker and Lopez to get the rest to turn off their radios since that is the only way for the Omega to possess the soldiers. No! 
So with their plan underway, Tex and Church meet up in Caboose's mind as they are greeted with mental images of the Blues and begin to recruit as they hunt down O'Malley. Back in the real world, Griff and Donut patrol outside as they see Tucker, Sheila, and Lopez heading right towards them as they maintain their cool. I'm totally freaking out! I'm freaking out! Well, one of them at least. Meanwhile, on the inside, the rest of Caboose's mental images come out of hiding, and so does O'Malley as he takes out one of the mental images, which Tex and Church begin a hot pursuit. With the Reds refusing to turn off their radios, Tucker and Lopez go for plan B and play a little, what I like to call, the romantic passion of El Musica. Sure enough, their plan works as the Reds cave in, turning off their radios. O'Malley being taken out in a hail of gunfire, and there is peace once more throughout the canyon. Or is there? <laughs> well, it looks like we are back to old Doc again as he is spending his time in Blood Gulch's cave as he communicates with command, telling them that he has discovered some purple thing inside the cavern. And you want to take one guess who's with him? I'll give you a hint. If I ever meet him, I'm taking his eyes as souvenirs. Whoa, that was unlike me. That's right. O'Malley found another host to prey upon. And while that is going on... Griff recovers from his injuries after being run over by the tank, but only to realize that two-thirds of his battered body parts had to be replaced with Simmons' body parts. Thus, the replaced Simmons donated his parts with cybernetic enhancements, and as Griff begins to physically abuse his newfound organs by smoking and eating snack cakes, Sarge informs his team that Command tells him that Lopez has detailed information on how to eliminate the Blues once and for all, and they need to find a way to retrieve their robot. Which is why Sarge orders both Griff and Donut to do some reconnaissance work by spying on the Blue Base. Back at Blue Base, Caboose becomes jealous of Sheila and Lopez's personal time together. So Tucker decides to pull up his leadership britches and try to defuse the situation. However, the robots have other things on their minds. Tucker, I've been speaking with Lopez, and we feel that the machines have been treated unfairly in this canyon. On a regular basis, we are either being blown up, possessed by spirits, or just left out to rust. Huh? We have decided that until conditions improve, we are not going to help you in your battles. You're kidding, right? Do I look like I'm kidding? I like his idea of ironically saying, you go girl. You go girl. You go girl. Oh, thanks. Back in the secret tunnel, Dona comes across Doc as he notices that the good doctor may be a few cans short of a six pack, which brings him retreating back to the wrong base and... Oh no. Oh yeah. Oh crap. He is ambushed right in the middle of the lion's den. This gives Church the opportunity to devise a new plan by possessing Donut and negotiate a fake surrender to the Reds. Sarge agrees to their surrender, but only if they get Lopez and Donut back in return. Okay, but there's one catch! What in Shinola? Sarge, they want you to build two robots for their team. One for each prisoner that they're releasing. You think I'm a natural born idiot? The two robots that Sarge will make for the Blues are going to be nothing more than hollowed shells for Church and Tex to use from now on. As Tucker and Sarge work out the details, Church heads back to Blue Base, only to find out that Lopez and Sheila have hightailed it out of there. They left a little note informing the Blues that they plan to build their own robot army and want them to meet in the middle of the canyon around the same time as the Reds for a... Double surrender, I guess. Meanwhile, Sarge creates two new robots for the Blues with a couple of special modifications. One of which being that one robot is carrying a hidden microphone and a 10 megaton bomb, and the other is given a special code word that it must act upon. Robot number two! Code word! Dirtbag! Ow! That was totally wicked! The next day, everyone meets up to begin Operation Triangle of Confusion as the Blues and Reds begin exchanging captured soldiers and robots from their squads while Lopez becomes angry seeing his own kind being swapped around and takes matters into his own hands creating an even bigger perplexing clusterfuck for everyone. 
This gives Sarge the opportunity to call in an airstrike by calling into command as the radio signals are going haywire between Tucker and Sarge's helmets only to realize another twist to this story. What the hell, Vic? How do you know the red team? Why are you helping them against the blues? What the fuck is going on here? Private Tucker, you're on here too. Um, see, I, um, you guys are, uh, uh, I gotta go. Bad connection. And with that, the showdown is here as everybody begins yelling at one another until Tucker gets hit from behind by an RPG, giving O'Malley his grand introduction on his hover thingy. As the battle ensues, O'Malley manages to kidnap Lopez as he Jimmy rigs the teleporter into taking them anywhere across the galaxy. This creates a temporary truce between the Reds and Blues as they realize that they now have a common enemy and must unite as one for the first time. And after a couple of hours of reprogramming the teleporter, the group rushes in head-on, leaving Sheila and Donut behind at Blood Gulch. But they're not the only ones who stuck around. All right, you sons of bitches, I'm back. And I've got some... Hey, hey, where'd everybody go? Do I know you? Hey, you're the girl that killed me. Uh-oh. <laughs> How awkward. But not nearly as awkward as the team being stranded on different parts of the universe, with the season ending with Griff and Church being taken hostage. And thus concludes Season 2 of Red vs. Blue. And I do have to say, it is quite a step up from their last season. For one thing, the voice audio is way better than the first time around, and the sound quality is a lot more fluid. We also get to see a lot more personal background from all of these characters, especially Sheila and Lopez, who bring both a lot of more development than they did in the last season. However, they still need to work out a few kinks here and there, like for example, uh, Vic's uh, freakishly animatronic vo face every time he talks. Yeesh. But in the end, my final rating for Red vs. Blue Season 2 is without a doubt a 4 out of 5. And with that said, I look very forward to reviewing Season 3, which I will do sometime in March. Yeah, that sounds good. If you watchers out there want to watch Season 2 of Red vs. Blue in its entirety, without me interrupting it of course, feel free to click this screen right here and it'll take you straight to its channel. Now, if you'll excuse me, I got some personal grooming to do. Finally. Whew. Much better. Now that December's here, I don't have to worry about anything else for the rest of this year. Not a damn thing. <gasps> Hey dude, hate to interrupt all the reading and listen to the rock and music, but uh, movie's over dude. That's pretty much it. Not much else gonna happen now. So just uh, you know, turn it off. Go uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Now is the time for all good children to cross over. Go into the light Carol Ann. Thank you very much. <laughs>